This episode is sponsored by Wondrium. Stick around till the end of the video to learn more about it. Usually when people think of meditation, they think of something like this, but that's not the only kind of meditation that exists. This is also meditation. This is meditation. Also meditation. Can be meditation. Hello brains, I have three questions for you. Put them in the comments if you'd like. One is, do you meditate? Two is, how do you meditate? And three is, how consistently do you meditate? And the answer can be not at all. A lot of people in our community don't meditate because the second they sit down to try to meditate, their brain just floods with thoughts and anxieties and all these things that they've been really trying to avoid. And obviously because we have ADHD, we have a harder time regulating our attention. We have a harder time sticking to a mantra or staying focused on a guided meditation than maybe a neurotypical person would. And on top of that, we have a really hard time sitting still maybe if we have the hyperactivity, impulsivity, presentations of ADHD. So, all of that to say, a lot of times people with ADHD really struggle to meditate, really struggle to get into a regular meditation practice. But there's a really cool Zen saying that I like. I think it's something along the lines of, everyone should meditate 20 minutes a day. And if you don't have time, then it should be an hour. <laughs> because the busier we are, probably the more stressful our lives are, and meditation can be one way to kind of offload some of that stress. So everyone has kind of a line at which things are too much, they're overwhelmed, they're stressed out, and like maybe they melt down. And what therapists often use to describe this is like, imagine you have a glass and you're filling it with water. And no matter how good you are at keeping your cool, managing your stress, at some point, if people keep adding water to that glass, it's gonna overflow. And that's the point at which we're, we're incredibly stressed out, we might melt down. Let's say you wake up and you're a little stressed, things have been stressful lately, but like, you're all right. And then you're going through your day and then something stressful happens. Maybe you realize that there's a meeting that you weren't prepared for on your schedule and you forgot about completely and so you're trying to prep for that. So let's say your stress level spikes a little bit because, oh, great, meeting, I wasn't prepared. And then it's starts to come down a little bit because like you're going through your day, but then you're going to make coffee and you realize like you're out of coffee and you're like, shoot, so stress level up a little bit. It goes down a little bit and then you can't figure out what to wear. Stress level spikes a little bit. So you start driving to work and you pick up coffee on the way and that goes well. So your stress level starts to come down, but then like you take a hard turn and you spill coffee on yourself, right? Now your stress level is pretty high. So now depending on where your baseline was, like this might've put you over the edge, but let's say you were in a real good place starting that morning it hasn't put you over the edge yet. So your stress levels come down a little bit, but then you get to work and then the tiniest thing happens. Like maybe somebody like goes through a door and then like slams it and doesn't let you, in. like that can be enough to be like, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with people in the world today? Like, why are people so rude? And like, I was, couldn't you see I was trying to get in the door and like you lose it. Not because that incident was so bad in and of itself, but because your stress levels were so high that you were right almost at that line anyway. So that pushed you over. There are a lot of things that we can do to kind of de-stress like even sleep, sleep is a way to offload some of the stress of the day. You usually wake up feeling a little less stressed out than you went to bed. Laughter, watching comedies, snuggling with my dog. There's a lot of ways to kind of keep stress levels under that boiling point, right? Meditation is one of the most effective. There's been a lot of research on this. Meditation is really, really good for stress and anxiety. And that's really important for those of us with ADHD because a lot of the time we're stressed and anxious because those little things that keep going wrong or those little stressors, we get those a lot. Like that might be unusual for, for most people, but for somebody with ADHD, it's normal. And so we're really riding that stress line a lot of the time. A lot of people with ADHD are like right here a lot of the time. It doesn't take much for us to be pushed over the edge and for us to spiral out or to lose our temper at somebody. And so meditation can be helpful for anybody, but especially for people with ADHD, we've got to find ways to bring that stress level down. Meditation itself, can also feel stressful. We don't wanna necessarily force ourselves. And there are times where like, maybe we're not ready to sit down and be alone with our thoughts. But if we are so stressed out that we don't feel like we have time to meditate, or we are so attacked by our thoughts the second we sit down to meditate, that's actually a really good sign that we probably should be meditating. One of the most common that people are aware of is mindfulness meditation, where you sit and are aware of your thoughts, you let them you know, pass by almost like they're, they're clouds or cars in a street, you're standing on the side of the street just watching the cars go by, and you can notice what kinds of thoughts you're having, you can notice the patterns, but you don't go chasing after the cars, I think is how Headspace explained it to me. You don't wanna be standing in the middle of the street getting run over by the cars, you don't wanna go chasing the cars, you're just standing on the sidewalk going, huh, there's a lot of orange cars today. And you can notice that, but not judge it. You don't wanna judge your thoughts, just recognize patterns. 
There's also moving meditation, which a lot of people with ADHD like. Walking, Tai Chi, I do restorative yoga, any kind of gentle movement that gets us kind of grounded into our bodies and is a bit of a break for our mind. If you're on your phone while you're walking, that's not a meditation <laughs> because you're not giving your brain space to wander. You know, you're watching a YouTube video, your brain's paying attention to something. This is your focused attention. And meditation, one of the reasons it can reduce stress is because it gives our focused attention a break. And we need that break. ADHD brains really need time to wander. We need time for our attention to just kind of float where we're not putting that demand of stay focused on this, stay focused on this. A walking meditation would be just noticing one foot in front of the other, maybe looking around, seeing the leaves, seeing the trees, just being kind of present in the moment without giving yourself more input, without taking a phone call, without checking your email, anything like that. There's also something called focused meditation, which I just learned about today and didn't realize that that's what I was doing. But that's a sensory thing where you're paying attention to something sensory. You're counting beads or you're knitting is something that a lot of people with ADHD like because it is a kind of focused meditation. It kind of chills your brain out because all you're focusing on is counting stitches. It's just like, okay, four of this one, now four of this one, one of this one, one of this one. When I worked at a restaurant, I found it really relaxing at the end of the shift to just fold napkins and just kind of get into the rhythm of it and the feel of it. Now I fold towels. I like having warm towels. If I forgot to take them out of the dryer, I'll spin them again so that they're warm and then I'll make a big pile and I'll sit there and fold the towels. And that's a kind of focused meditation where all I'm paying attention to is the texture and the feel of this and, and folding towels. You can do body scans where you notice if you've got tension in your head, you notice if you've got tension in your eyebrows and your ears and you just kind of relax body parts as you scan through your body. That one makes me really, really anxious. I don't like doing it, which might mean I should probably do it, I don't know. But different people like different types of meditation and kind of like exercise, like the best meditation for your brain is the one that you'll actually do because this is really something that benefits us a lot. The main meditation practice that I use is transcendental meditation and they recommend you do it twice a day. So 25 minutes in the morning and 25 minutes in the afternoon. I have never stuck to this consistently like every morning and every afternoon for like an extended period of time, but I do notice it when I do it regularly. I'm way more chill. My anxiety is not as bad. And it's gonna be different for everybody, and I realize that, but like for me personally, it makes a huge difference. So what they taught us to do in Transcendental Meditation is wash your face. So I actually will get up out of bed in the morning. First thing I do is I go brush my teeth, I wash my face, I put some lotion on and stuff, and then I go back and I meditate. But I'm still getting into my bed to meditate, so the second thing they say is leave your head free. You want your back supported, but you want your head free so that you're not like leaning against a pillow because that's a cue to your brain that says fall asleep now, it's cool. And so you have your back supported, and then for a couple minutes you just, you sit. And you can do this with any mantra meditation, like OM is something that a lot of people do, but with Transcendental Meditation, um, your teacher actually gives you like a specific word that is your mantra and you're not supposed to share it, so I, I won't tell you. Actually say it out loud, so it'd be like, if your word was like OM, you just go OM, 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 and then slowly you say it a little quieter, OM, OM, until you're just saying it in your head and you're just repeating it. Om. And the thought is like, if you give your brain that to focus on, there's less room for other thoughts. Other thoughts will still come up and that's normal. That's one of the biggest myths and misconceptions about meditating is that like, if you're having thoughts, you're doing it wrong. That's what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to have thoughts pop up. That's what your brain does. And, it, and if you're not distracting it, it's probably gonna think a lot of things. <laughs> so a lot of thoughts tend to come up, especially if you haven't meditated much before or in a while. But the idea is instead of, again, chasing those thoughts, you just go, okay, that's thought. And then you bring yourself back to that mantra. One of the biggest things that I personally notice right away when I meditate is the chatter usually decreases and there are some times that I get to that like magical, like what we imagine meditating as where I'm not having any thoughts and it's really nice and it's really peaceful. And it kind of feels like my, my hands like blend together. It's like this deep relaxation for me that happens with transcendental meditation. And I'd be curious what your experience is if you, if you meditate. So let's talk about meditation myths. One, meditation has to look like this. You don't have to be in the lotus position, you don't even have to be flexible to do it. You don't have to sit still. Quite often when I go to meditate in the morning, I'm antsy, I'm restless, I move a little bit, I need to crack 
my knuckles or my dog wants to join me. So I'll, I'll let her climb into my lap and snuggle with me. You do not have to stay perfectly still during meditation for it to work. Another myth is that you're supposed to not have any thoughts in your head and you're supposed to be completely zened out and peaceful. And if you're not, you're doing it wrong. What I was taught with meditation is if you're sitting and letting your thoughts do their thing and coming back to your mantra or coming back to your breath or, or counting your knitting stitches or whatever, you're meditating and whatever your brain is doing in terms of like all the chatter, all the thoughts that are happening in your head, that's a normal part of meditation and the reason why we meditate because we want to learn not to chase after all those thoughts. A really good distinction that my meditation teacher pointed out was, you know, while you're meditating, you might think about, oh, you know what I'd really like to do? I'd love to go to Hawaii. So as long as you don't then start planning your trip to Hawaii, you're meditating. I don't want to pressure anybody to do anything that they're not ready for, but I just want to make sure that people are making an informed decision. Like if you're not meditating, I want to make sure that the reasons you're not meditating aren't myths and misconceptions. With ADHD, I'm all about looking for optimal treatment and what that looks like is going to be different for everybody. And maybe there are people where meditation just really is not the right thing for them right now and okay, but I at least want people to be educated on what's available and what research says helps and research says this helps. Oh, ooh, it's a researcher. It's Patrick. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Good. That was good timing. Perfect. Yeah, we're just getting to the end uh -huh. of the, the vlog. So, yeah, um, I'm, I'm sitting here talking about, like, meditation and trying to convince people to, to try it and also, like, show them that, like, maybe they're already meditating in some ways because there's different types of meditation, including, like, knitting, I didn't realize, can be a form of meditation. No, I think, so, as far as meditation, I kind of, like... I don't know, the more mindfulness, kind of fixating your attention on something. Yeah. And kind of grounding yourself in an experience. The difference between mindfulness and meditation is meditation is a form of mindfulness. Mindfulness is just being present and grounded in the moment. And meditation is a formal practice of that. So in meditation, you're sitting down, you're carving out time to formally practice mindfulness. But mindfulness is something you can practice any time of the day. So going down the stairs earlier, I was feeling the wood beneath my feet. And that's a form of mindfulness. But I'm not like booking time in my schedule to like walk down my stairs barefoot so that I can feel the wood under my feet. If I did, now it would be meditation. Yeah, I like that actually. That sounds pretty darn right. So do you meditate, Patrick? Man, I used to more consistently in grad school. Is there a reason why you were um, doing it during grad school and not anymore? Like as a formal practice? <laughs> I think like with most things, it just kind of fell to the wayside. I know in grad school, I just noticed a couple times where I felt like my mind was running crazy and I was like all right 10 minutes take 10 minutes to do this so I would literally just shut my office door like lay on the ground find some YouTube video and just go through that and consistently every time I was like wow that was good is meditation more useful for people with ADHD is it less useful is it is it harder like um so I know anecdotally there's definitely some resistance to it um, because it's like, well, I, by definition, have a hard time focusing. And a lot of these exercises are focusing on something for an extended period of time. A lot of that is just training your attention, like training those attention muscles. So John Mitchell and I think it's Lydia Zalowska, the analogy, and they kind of talk about it as you're training your brain on how to turn on the flashlight. So that's your attention, how to hone in and focus that flashlight on the thing you want to not, you know, if you hear a wrestling around the corner or something like not to move that flashlight elsewhere, like to keep it fixed, to do those things, to notice stuff and not let it completely dysregulate you. Is there any reason why somebody might not want to meditate? I'm glad you're highlighting that because it's not for everyone. You know, let's say if you're really depressed and you're being mindful and present about how miserable your day is. I think if you try it, if it feels like you're having a hard time with it, like I can't keep my focus with this, like every person will be like, just gently bring your attention back. Like it's okay, you're not supposed to be perfect. If it's causing you to feel bad, maybe don't do it. But otherwise, if you feel loose, relaxed afterwards, like that's a pretty good indication that this might be helpful. Okay, cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah. It's been so helpful for me. And I, I know the research is really positive on it. So I was just like, everyone should do this. But no, like not, there's nothing that everyone should do. Everyone's different and everybody's situation is different. So yeah, listen to Patrick. He's a, he's a professional. And if you live in Colorado, you can actually work with him. Uh, he's a fantastic ADHD psychologist. I will, I will put his uh, website in the description as well. Thank you, Patrick. Absolutely, Jessica. Have a good one. All right. You too. Bye. So I've officially started writing my book and I'm really nervous about it. Meditation is helping. So is Wondrium. I've been taking this course on Wondrium about writing creative nonfiction and it's so good. 
The professor breaks down what creative nonfiction is, what the responsibilities are that I have to my readers, even how to write a great beginning. Every episode, I learn something new and super helpful. I'm only a little way into the course because it keeps sparking ideas and I keep going off to write, which is fine. Wondrium is on demand, so I can go off and do other things and come back to it when I'm ready. It's given me a lot of confidence, especially writing my first book. And so far, it's going really well. My editor is impressed. If you haven't heard of Wondrium before, it's the rebrand of The Great Courses Plus, and it's designed for curious brains. Wondrium has a ton of courses, and anything you want to watch is included in a monthly subscription. How-tos, tutorials, documentaries, Wondrium is where you can find the answer to pretty much everything you've ever wondered about, and they're constantly adding new stuff. You can browse by subject and add stuff you're interested in to your watch list so you can find it again later. You can stream it on your phone, tablet, computer, projector. There's even an option to switch to audio while you're driving. Wondrium is offering a free trial right now, and they're regular supporters of this show, so by supporting them, you're also supporting us. If you'd like to try it out, go to wondrium.com slash howtoadhd or click on the link in the description below to start your free trial today. Thank you to my brain advocates and all my Patreon brains. I love that I get to make content like this. I love that we get to do what's right for us and our community as opposed to having to wonder like what's trending right now. So thank you for that. Let me know in the comments below if you want me to do more on meditation. There are researchers I can talk to. I can dig in a little bit more as to like the different types of meditation and their their specific benefits and which ones might be more effective for ADHD. Let me know if that's something you're interested in and uh, like, subscribe so you don't miss that content and I will see you next video. Bye brains. Thank you.